Games for Change, folks, come on down. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us, DJ, and thank you guys for uh, sticking around. That was really exciting. I think the last hour, hour and a half, to hear about what Epic is doing and all of these uh, amazing creators who are using VR and AR uh, for good. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Susanna Pollock, and I'm president of an organization called Games for Change. Uh, has anyone been to the Games for Change Festival here? All right, great. So a couple of you have, yeah? Some of you have spoken at the Games for Change Festival. Um, so those of you who don't know about um, Games for Change, we are a, um, a not-for-profit that, uh, let's see, here we go. A not-for-profit that um, has been around for, since 2004. And uh, our mission is to empower game creators and, um, and other immersive media creators to drive world, world, world impact through games and the media they create. Um, we have an event that we produce every year called the Games for Change Festival, which I'll talk to you a little bit. We also work with youth and other um, non-for-profits and foundations to help them enter the space and fund and use these kind of experiences to further the social good. Um, we, last year, we decided to expand our mission to include XR. Uh, we initially called it a VR for Change initiative, and what we saw was happening in our community was, uh, like many of you, game developers were starting to explore different platforms in which to start, tell their stories and create new experiences. And at the same time, we saw foundations and NGOs and government agencies also looking at these new mediums in which to uh, further their work. And we felt ourselves in, a, in a, a good position to help build this community, very much in the same way we've built the Games for Change community which is a community of developers, creators, um, researchers, people in academia, people in the government, um, uh, from large NGOs, so um, and media and brands. So what you have here is a really cross-sector, public, private community and is a great place to network and to, um, and to find collaborative partners. So we started the XR for Change initiative and we have a series that we host at SAP called the Talk and Play series. We focus on XR experiences um, focused on different themes. We focus on education, on health, um, and on civic and social impact. Um, very much like these meetups, you have a chance to hear from creators and explore what they do. Um, coming up is our festival, which um, DJ referenced, and I'm, it's coming up very soon, in, in a, a little over a week. Um, I welcome you all to consider to check us out, uh, either for the entire festival or perhaps for the XR for Change Summit, which is on the 30th. Uh, we do have a discount code for you guys. We have also have indie rates and not-for-profit rates, so it's affordable for, for people who are starting out in this space. Um, but like... Um, we do in the Games for Change side, we do try to focus the conversations around how games and VR, AR, and MR are used for education to uh, drive awareness and, and empathy and humanitarian issues, and then also uh, for health and neurogaming and how, it, how these technologies can advance science and, and treatment for many, many people. Uh, there's a really cool program that we run before the event, which is a brain jam. Um, this is going to happen starting on Monday night. Uh, we have 60 uh, XR developers coming together to work with um, uh, researchers, neuroscience researchers, to see how XR can help uh, develop the research and advance the research of these scientists. Um, we have selected our teams, but you are welcome to join if you're interested on a Wednesday afternoon to hear about the projects that come out of this space, this, this experience, to try their, uh, their prototypes, uh, and to do some networking. So if you're interested in doing that, I'm here and Asif in the back is here as well, um, and we can uh, hook you up and you can come. And then, of course, on the 30th is our XR for Change Summit. Um, this is where you're going to have a day long of talks, uh, panels, workshops, networking opportunities, and a chance to check out a lot of really cool VR experiences, um, which some of which are, are here, that you guys are, are presenting. Um, so uh, we'll talk about that, that in a minute. Uh, the Immersive Arcade will, in will include projects like Greenland Melting, which is J uh, Jamie's project, Thousand Cut Journey, which is Courtney's, and other, other projects that are either premieres, like Lost City of Mirror, or Terminal 3 from Asad Malik, which was uh, recently d doing the festival circuit. Um, so you'll see a variety of experiences um, and, uh, and get to meet creators who are working in the space. 
Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, move the conversation over from, from us at Games for Change and XR for Change um, and introduce you to, to three people who are part of our community. Uh, we have a, a program called the XR for Change Ambassadors where we try to uh, bring together those who've been really driving um, the development of the sector, uh, both as a way to help foster conversations and collaboration, but also help us lead in developing new programs that will that will help uh, the community as, as we look to grow it. So I, I invited some friends to join us, so thank you guys. Um, doing a little bit of intro, uh, and then I'm going to allow them to talk a little bit about their work. They each have a different perspective and an intersection point into XR, both as creators, researchers, advisors, and, and investors, um, all of which are really important to the work that, that we do. Um, so first I have, um, well, in no particular order, we have Jamie Pallett from Emblematic Group. He's, he's not the hard one to pick out in the group. Um, uh, Jamie is a co-founder of Emblematic Group with Nani de la Pena, and he's going to talk a, a little bit about their work in immersive journalism and some great tools that they're developing. Um, then we also have Dr. Dr. Courtney Cogburn from Columbia University doing some really interesting work with... Um, uh, uh, stress that's brought on by racial tension and how VR can uh, help uh, support and drive uh, research in that in that space. And then Adora Udoji from yeah, close close enough uh, from Bosha Group, who has been working a lot with different um, industries and and advising on the VR AR space is also a professor. Um, and I'd love to hear about your perspective on where this sector is going. Um, love to talk a little bit about, you know, is there a bottom, double bottom line there out there? So you think about that. We'll come to you last. Okay. First, um, so let's, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit, uh, Courtney, about your work at Columbia. I love the space that you're coming from, right? That you are not coming into this space as a, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but as a, as a programmer or as a, someone with a technical expertise. You came to this space going, I see an opportunity that can help further my work. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you're doing. Um, yeah, so I'm a uh, psychologist by training and also trained in public health and social work. I'm in a school of social work. Um, my work focuses on the effects of racism on health. I think particularly about cultural racism, so the use of imagery, language, um, which led me to media and thinking about how exposure to media can actually impact health at a physiological level. Uh, eventually, I became interested in thinking about how to leverage media to produce counter narratives, to think about how to uh, influence people's understanding of issues around race and racism, which in my experience um, is uh, wrong in, in our public discourse, um, certainly very narrow. And so I approached a team at Stanford University, the Virtual Human Interaction Lab, and asked just a cold email if they would be interested in working on a project that focused on racism. They were, and we got funding to, to launch this project um, and premiered it at uh, the Tribeca Film Festival this, this year. So really an interesting journey. Um, the piece really takes a first person point of view, putting you in the shoes of a black male at different points in his life, as a child, as an adolescent, and as a young adult, experiencing racism across the life course in different contexts. Um, and we're particularly interested in the uh, research component of this as social scientists. So we are interested in measuring what impact are we actually having on people as they go through an experience like this. We're certainly interested in empathy. We think that's important. We're interested in things like bias, uh, but we are also invested in pushing beyond that and thinking not just about how people feel, but how they act and think differently, potentially, as a result of, a, of an experience like this. So we'll begin data collection on the experience uh, beginning this summer um, and do some longitudinal analyses and get a sense of if we're having an immediate effect and if that effect lasts or change um, even weeks after they've gone through the experience. That's, I mean, fascinating work. And more research like that does need to be done in this space so we can show the efficacy of and what kind of impact it's actually having. Um, how, how are you doing that research? I'm just curious, like, what it, what, how are you tracking that information? And is it PM, uh, pre and post testing? Yeah, there's different ways to go about it. So in our initial design, we'll do a baseline study two weeks before people come into the laboratory, before they know the study has anything to do with race or racism. So we want just sort of their natural reactions, their natural measures of empathy and uh, what we call structural competence, the ability to think about social issues as being rooted in structures and systems and not just individual choice and behavior. Uh, they'll come into the lab two weeks later, go through the experience. We'll measure those exact same things right after they come out of the headset. 
And then we'll follow up with them again three weeks after that um, to, again, the same measures to get a sense of if the effect is changing or lasting beyond the initial impact. But there's, there's different ways to go about uh, you know, the research design. Uh, it seems that that, that, I mean, that is a very important component of, of uh, or can be an important um, component of a, a VR for good experience. Um, and I'm curious how much of, let's say, of your funding what, like, goes towards that versus to the, the, the product itself. And what I found in the Games for Change space for years is that you know, it's, it's difficult enough to get a uh, project funded and then the, the efficacy of the research afterwards is an after effect. And very often, you know, independent producers, they just can't afford to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, so we, we, the first round of funding went you know, um, uh, directly to the development of the piece. And we got another round of funding to really explore the empirical components and think about ways to scale. And, and it can be very expensive. But I also think there's, I'm interested in, in engaging with people around this. I don't think everyone needs to launch an empirically rigorous study around each of their pieces. There's other ways to evaluate uh, impact and the effect that you're having on people in, in much simpler ways that are also very meaningful that don't require lots of money. So I think it's worth it to to think strategically about how to get some of that data and even in a more informal way. Yeah, well, I think that brings up the point about different kind of outcomes you could look for in a, a, a VRXR for good, right? There is behavioral change. Right there's we talk about driving empathy and it could be it could be as simple as building awareness around an issue right and, and raising a conversation, um, uh, which kind of leads me to some of uh, Jamie's work which I'd love to and I have got some slides which I can I'll be your Bring on the slides yeah I'll be <laughs> your I'll, you tell me when to move but um, it's it, it's really interesting the the area that you guys have carved out um, for yourselves in helping drive where journalism is going in the future I mean I think you're having a real impact. Hopefully, um, we, yes, who we are, what we do. So we're a nomadic group. Um, I'm, yes, just not uh, okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm a co-founder with Nonni de la Pena, who's a real pioneer in this field. She's the real creative visionary. I'm the English guy. Um, <laughs> we, we do what we make what we call immersive journalism. So using VR on, and AR mostly to recreate actual situations and put you inside real events that happen so you can understand them better. Um, very quick swath of, uh, no, 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 no. So just a quick range of stuff. Uh, we Who Remain was a piece we made for the New York Times set in the Nuba Mountains in South Sudan, where there's a still ongoing civil war. That was a, a multi-narrative um, 360 VR piece. We could follow the path of six different people who are in the middle of the conflict. Second piece was called Across the Line. We made this for Planned Parenthood. And what they came to us, what they wanted was a piece that would recreate for the, the, the user the experience of having to run the gauntlet of protesters waving placards in your face as you try to get to a Planned Parenthood clinic. So you literally, all this stuff is volumetric. You literally, you walk and you are accosted by these people in the end, you hear real audio of what has been said to, to patients. Um, thirdly, we have a partnership with Frontline, the documentary producers, funded by the Knight Foundation, a goal of which was to see what we could do uh, in VR in, to further the documentary genre, but also to measure the effects of how effective the uh, documentary can be. So three pieces, the one, the little picture you can barely see here, is called After Solitary, about a guy who spent more than three years in a, in a sol solitary confinement cell in the main state prison. Um, the other piece is Greenland Melting, which I'll get to in a little bit. The last one, we have to pay the bills, so we did some work for branded clients, including Cartier. They paid us in diamonds. Kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Um, uh, the, the big change in focus for us in the last year or so has been more, better ways of capturing data that we use to build these, build these experiences. It used to be very simplistic, like 80s video game style stuff, because that's all we could afford. Um, two things have happened. One we call photogrammetry, which you can now use an SLR camera to capture a geometrically precise photo real three-dimensional space that you can then walk around in. That's really... This is the, the data points are not showing up on here, but it's fine. It's fine. Anyway, that's the, that, that's the cell, solid environment cell you can see. You can walk around every inch of it, bend down inches away to any surface, and it has the resolution of a high-quality photograph, but it's, it's three-dimensional. Um, that's places, but how do you do people? So again, we used to work with pretty much clunky video avatars. Now there is what we call volumetric video capture, essentially a green screen in the round, 50-plus cameras. Super expensive to do. Um, we are fortunate to have a deal with a company called 8i in LA, which lets us do this for much, much less because they believe in journalism and then showing what you can use these tools to do. So, I th and I think we were the first people to 
combine the process of capturing a hologram of somebody like that and then dropping that hologram into the photogrammetry space so you get to hear the story from the actual person in the actual place. Okay, yeah, that, that's, so that, that's Kenny, who was the inmate. We, we filmed him in that stage in LA and then dropped that OBJ file into the cell. So it's like you're in the cell with him telling you his story. Almost done. I'm going to zoom along here because I, I know we have very, very little time. Um, yes, it's all about uh, presence and empathy. When you hear Kenny tell you his story in that cell, it, it's, it's, it's much, much more moving than seeing it in 2D. It just is. You feel like you're there with him. We also think that VR has the power to, uh, it's not just about making you feel more strongly, you can also intuit more information, bodily, spatially, physically. So we're kind of on a role now of like these kind of what we call data visualizations, where we put you inside situations that you can understand more deeply if you're there with your full body and experience it in every dimension. So this is a little video I want to run. This is Greenland melting about the, the melting Greenland ice cap. The video, this there. tends not to run. So I can also just okay. walk you through what, what would be happening if it were running. I don't think um, it works. Uh, is it, is it it's, it's I, I can talk through it, it's fine. Okay. Um, basically, you're, two NASA scientists are showing you around the glacier, what's wrong with it. You're in a helicopter, you're in a boat, you're seeing how they do all their research. At some point, you can put your head down and you float below the surface of the water. I mean, we have a 3D, well, a moving 3D diagram that shows all the relative warm water currents, how big they are and how fast they move. So it's, it puts you right inside of it. And it, it just, you feel it more, you feel it more deeply and you also you take in a certain kind of information more rapidly than you would if it was just text or 2D images. And almost done, sorry, going on a bit long. Our next focus is a thing called REACH, which is a platform to help small news organizations who don't have big budgets to make volumetric VR uh, making a toolkit so it's easier and cheaper for them to tell volumetric stories, capture locations, and put um, hologram style into it inside. And when will oh, that was really that was well, well done, <laughs> well done, James. A lot of information there. When will uh, when do you think Reach is going to be able October. to enter the market? October. Uh, the ONA, the on Online News Association. Actually, is it maybe September? Anyway, the fall. And again, who is the market for this? Who? who? Uh, we're working with the Gannett newspapers. So the Arizona Republic is the first team to do it. They have a story about a, a tragic story about a. I'm going to come really on and tell the whole thing. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get I'll get to that. Later. Okay. Yeah, it's newspapers wanting to tell stories, spatial stories, stories that revolve around a very specific physical location. That being able to be inside that location helps you understand what happened. But what this is a tool that can be used to allow people to go to uh, to produce quickly. Less expensively, yes, yes, indeed. right, and with with less uh, knowledge necessary. I mean, it's a it's a it's an easier Anyone tool to use. Anyone can learn how to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right, yeah. and that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, and that's a partnership with who did you? Uh, Knight Foundation again. They've been very good to us, so they gave us a big grant to do this, and um, and with Mozilla, who has the platform called A Frame. So this is publishable on the web, no download, no separate app. You're going to be able to experience volumetric. VR directly off the browser. That's the most important part that I forgot to mention. Okay. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> That's great. Well, no, I'm really excited to see this when you when you launch it. Um, and you said when are you launch? You said October at an event. It's at the Online News Association, okay. which I think is it's either late September, early October. Any journalists here? Or any work working with me? Thank yeah? you. Late All September. Right, cool. Whew. All right. Um, and at the XR for Change Summit, you're going to be demoing Greenland. Greenland melting, yeah. Melting, and you are going to be demoing Thousand Cut Journey, which is great. So thank you guys. So now, Adora, I know you're sitting there going, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> uh, no, I'm really glad you joined this panel. Uh, I think you have a really interesting perspective on this industry, um, uh, and you intersect with so many different people who are, are working in this space. Can you explain a little bit of what you do? And then I'm going to po pose you with lots of questions. Don't we all enjoy that question? Tell me about yourself. Um, <laughs> Essentially, I, I work uh, in the middle of all of this emerging technology, and I've had a bunch of different seats at the table, um, meaning I've worked on the venture side, I'm an angel, I work with corporates, I do a lot of advising with corporates. I actually produced, wrote, and directed a piece uh, that was part of Daydream Impact's launch back in the fall. It was an anti-bullying piece, you know, to your point around the efficacy, I'd love to talk to you about some of that because the whole idea is was is and was to focus on teenagers who are an intractable crowd don't really want to hear too much from us adults about 
what bullying and anti-bullying, what they should and shouldn't be doing, as it turns out. 13-year-olds can't hear us. Um, so the question is, is VR, can you, is, is the impact, is it more effective to create content in VR to get through to them in some material way? And some of the early signs are looking pretty good, but we have a long way to go, as we know. It's very, very early days. So, so I would say that I, I, I look at this from a um, 360, very broad view. I work all over the world with companies and investors, and I think we're at a very interesting point in time, and on any given day, um, I'm either super encouraged or I'm super like, this is fucking never gonna happen. <laughs> um, you too, huh? And, and, today is, and today is sort of one of those days. The good news is, in the last year, and I think this is true for many of us in the room, if not everyone, even for those who are learning, just learning about, I've met some people here earlier who are just really learning about VR and AR and so on. There's so many converging technologies and we're just not sure how they're all gonna work together, AI and VR and AR and robotics and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So having said that, that generates just a tremendous amount of confusion, right, about what's happening. And all of this is iterating incredibly fast. In other words, in one year, and even with the work that Nani's done, I mean, she was, it was her piece three, almost four years ago that I first saw the Trayvon Martin um, story that they did was really profoundly well done. And all the way up to the, to the material that they produce today is radically, radically different. And why is that? The software is innovating. We've heard, we heard from somebody from Unreal today. There's all sorts of software that is being developed around computer visualization and uh, tools to make things. And then hardware, right? We know that it, it's changing. I mean, we have Oculus Go now. We have things that are cordless and, and the experience is a, a little bit better. Um, is it moving as fast as most of us who are working in it would like? Absolutely not. But on par, we are moving very quickly. Now, where's the money? See, this is what I spend a lot of time with. Where, where is the money? That's really tricky because it ebbs and flows, because it's not abundantly clear across sector, whether you're in medicine, health, education, media, zoology, it doesn't matter. Across sectors and industries, people are experimenting with these technologies, VR, AR, all of them in all kinds of ways. And they ebb and flow, meaning a couple of years ago, and we can see the proof if you go to YouTube VR and you Google um, commercials, you'll see every brand name that you can ever imagine, and you'll see it clustered around 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. The marketing companies mm -hmm. were writing checks. Mm -hmm. They were like, this is cool, this is novel, this is when we're, when we're at South By and we're gonna launch Game of Thrones and we're gonna do this or we're gonna do that, we're gonna have an attending VR piece. And then they couldn't figure out, like, well, what is the value of that, like, a year or two later? Because the access points aren't very high. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of headsets that are out there. It's somewhere north of 30 million of the Google Cardboard type headsets. And then for the premium headsets, you're talking somewhere around the 2 million mark. Not a lot, right? And so PlayStation VR came out. That was encouraging because you have this inspired and highly motivated target audience. And you have content, right, and IP that works well in that space. So you see a little bump there. But still, you're not talking in a country of 300 and something million people, when you only have a couple of million who have actual access to this, it really discourages brands and corporates from wanting to invest too heavily. Which is why, at this point, what I see more of is just corporates are investing, lots of labs, you know, whether you're SAP or Warner Music, they all have some sort of foundry innovation lab here in New York City that didn't even exist you know, a year ago for some of these, or two years ago. So you see the corporates expanding money, they're doing a lot of experimenting. You see collaborations happening with studios and Jaunt, for, they talked about some of the, the collaborations, but they've done a lot more collaborations, as have a lot of other um, content creators. And you see the universities and the academic uh, world really heavily uh, engage. And then you see heavy subsidization in like Canada, Canadian, the Canadians uh, subsidize a lot of R&D and content. And you see that in Europe, and you see that in Asia. We don't see that here. And we certainly don't see a lot of venture money going into um, VR, at least not right now. Um, you see spots of it, but not consistently, and it's been flat like really the last 18 months or so. So I think it's on par. It's all really encouraging um, because the quality of the, of the content and the applications um, are becoming more evident as time passes, but again, um, I think it's really hard to say what it looks like in three, five, seven years, except for it will be here.
It will be here, but we just don't know what form it's going to yeah. be or which one's going to lead, right? Is it, uh, is it uh, AR? I mean, he, there's a conversation. I mean, have you been researching and, and uh, advising on the AR versus VR? That conversation MR? makes me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me crazy because it's not a versus. Like, there are different applications where VR is just going to be far more uh, effective than AR could ever be. Um, and there are things, AR, the accessibility, because it's mobile, more immediately is abundantly clear. But the nature of what we're going, I mean, I was at the Augmented World Expo um, a couple of weeks ago. It was a really great conference. And by the way, this Game for Change conf conference here in New York is not to be missed. And one of the most powerful elements about it is how global it is. People come from all over the world. Like literally, uh, how many countries? Like yeah, dozens like and yeah, dozens and dozens. Yeah, 30 something and dozens. countries. Yeah. It's really, it's amazing to learn to, and talk to people who are creating um, all sorts of things. But, but they are Epson glasses. I hadn't tried those yet, and they are literally more comfortable than my glasses. And they're mixed, they're MR glasses. The field of view is not that great, but you can see where we're going. You could, I could easily wear them all day long. I mean, they were nice and comfortable, and then I was like fighting with the little dragons over here in the, in the corner, but then I'm in the real world. It was like really awesome. But that was one of the more interesting. I hadn't seen some of their hardware. Um, I mean, I'm sure many of you were, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Microsoft. Uh, uh, HoloLens, HoloLens. Um, and they d do some amazing things, but it's not, it's, you can't buy it in the store yet. Um, but these Epsons, and there's some other glasses, so it's some really interesting, I think, um, hardware that's coming that I think will make it easier. But then we got to make, build content, and you know, there's, there's yeah. things to be done. Um, Jamie, so you've experimented, you guys are not solely working with volumetric VR projects, you've got, you had some AR work mm -hmm. that you've done. How much more do you see the possibility, and, and is there, I know you say you work, you work for brands as well as these uh, more strictly, you know, yeah. for good stuff. How much interest is there in, I'll say, non-VR? You know, non-VR. Yeah, you in, in AR, in or, AR or MR, or and how much? You um, I think I agree, I agree with Adora with, with every single thing you said. I think it was brilliant. <laughs> seriously, like oh, wow, this, she really gets it. Woo! Um, uh, in the same way that there was that bump of everybody wanted VR for a while, that there was then the bump of like, everyone wanted AR. So we did, for example, we did, we did a series of jobs for the for Dow Jones, the Wall Street Journal, um, because Google was giving them money to develop products that showed off new Google platforms. So we made a 3D data visualization of live stock market data, inspired by the scene in um, Iron Man, where he conjures that thing of the city, like the hologram of the city, so like that, except it's a stock market. Um, which actually was a pretty powerful, useful tool if, you're a, you know, if, you're a, if you follow the stock market that closely. But we built it once, I think, for Tango, and then we built it again for AR Core, and then we built it again for Apple AR Kit, so we, we followed the whole kind of evolution of the industry, basically, like, here comes more money to make this thing again in the whatever the platform happens to be now. Now, um, I mean, I, I, do think, I don't think they are as different as everyone seems to like to make them out to be. Nani describes it as a difference between, you know, you create a document that you do, do export this as a Word doc or a PDF. It's a little more than that, but most of the work that goes into conceptualizing and developing and building the actual stuff, 90% of it is the same. Whether you then push it out into a um, an environment that's immersive, that's VR, or whether you push it out onto uh, superimpose it onto your own actual environment of the real world, which they are, that's actually you know a pretty small piece of the picture. So um, I do think where I see the the optimism in terms of the money coming in and, and the growth is enterprise. I mean, this is not on, this is not on the for good at this point, but. You know, but it can be. It can be it enterprise. Can be. So we we made a train we made a training simulation. That was a great piece, by the way, about the the um, heads up display for the first responders. We made a simulation for a big tech company. We're not allowed to say who it is, but you can Google it. Um, <laughs> whew. Um, there was a police tra a, poli a police officer training simulation for de-escalation. Um, you are the officer. The person, the person of interest, and you can say and do various things, and the, the person of interest gets more or less agitated. So AI, VR, but training, and that, and that stuff's taking off. In, you know, Walmart just launched this huge, huge program to train all their employees, oh, right? right? That, that's where the big money's being spent. Large packaged goods companies who spend a shitload of money, that's a technical term, a shitload of money, um, <laughs> to, the, you know, they, where they have like basically, uh, you know, fake, stores where they have shelves full of stuff and different sizes and colors and they like try out different 
why are you doing that physically? You can, you, could do, you can do that in VR for like a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the, of the time that it takes. So right, there's no doubt that this, this medium, whatever you want to call it, XR, you know, um, is super powerful and has the capacity to transform a lot of what we do, industry as well as you know, culture and entertainment and, and, and hopefully social impact. Um, but the, the ecosystem is so fractured. So fractured. We just did a, um, I'm very proud to say, we created, we built the first piece of VR to go into the permanent collection at the Guggenheim for a chi Chinese conceptual artist called Lin Yulin. And the piece is, it's a, cr it's a crazy ass piece. You're a basketball, Jeremy Lin walks <laughs> up to you, he picks you up, he dribbles you, and then he throws you through the net. And our first response is, you can't do that. Everyone's going to be puking their guts out. It works. Um, but we used a, a, a latest edition headset by one of the top suppliers you know, that makes them, and six of them have broken over the course of three months of head, because there's a line around the, around the room to see this thing. As, as users, as the, as the people at the experience, they're yes. breaking on, in the museum. Yeah, and this they is like the handle, top headset by one of the top suppliers. Yeah. Like they, the, the hardware's not there yet. Mm. How long is that experience? Like how? Thankfully, it's short. <laughs> it's like a minute and a half. Okay, I don't know how long cool. I could be a basketball, um, but that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, that is pretty wild. Um, I, we only have a few minutes left. I feel like everyone's going to want to try some more demos and, and drink and eat or whatever's going to be happening afterwards. But I want to talk to, I just want to ask you, Courtney, from your perspective, as someone, how long ago did you decide to get into this? I'm curious, into making this VR project. When was that email to Two years Stanford? ago. Two years ago. So now here you are, two years into the project, or you, you've, you've completed in the project, where would you go next? Would you stay with this medium? Or do you think there's other new technology out there that say, you know, if I'd only known, or if this had only existed, I would do it differently, or I'm ex excited to explore something else? You know, it was really, it was really exploratory, and I, I went in as a skeptic, um, not really knowing if I could meaningfully represent experiences of racism in VR, if this was the medium to do that. I didn't want this to come across as entertainment. Uh, for people, and so there, there were some ethical issues that I continue to grapple with, um, taking on these sorts of issues in VR. But post uh, the Tribeca Film Festival, we had this uh, booth where we had a blank wall where people wrote their reactions as they came out of the the headset. And based on those reactions and the, you know the really thoughtful conversations I had with people, it does feel like there's a lot of potential. Um, for doing the things we hope it does. And, and like you were saying, we're still early in knowing whether it does these things that we claim we want it to do, right? Empathy and changing behavior and those sorts of things. But I think it is worth it to, to try it out. Um, I think we have a long way to go. There's, there's lots of elements. I have some concerns about how people are uh, pushing boundaries of pain and trauma exposure through VR. Um, it's not like watching a movie. It is different. Um, and we don't really understand exactly how it's different or what we're doing to people as a result of putting them through these sorts of experiences, what they're walking away with. So I think there's a lot of ethical concerns um, that we need to be talking about. But um, in, based on my experience so far, it's, it's definitely worth uh, an, this undertaking. My last point is that I think to do this meaningfully, I think we need um, you know, what we call transdisciplinary teams. Um, not just multiple experts sharing their, their point of view at the table, but through a transdisciplinary approach, really coming together, creating something new, new knowledge, uh, solving the same problem, which is a really different approach of integrating disciplines. So you need social workers, you need psychologists, you need artists, you need programmers, you need all of those people, I think, at the same table, especially when you're taking on for good uh, projects, when you're thinking about representing the narratives of vulnerable in oppressed communities, for instance, uh, we need to be very thoughtful. From the, the beginning. From the very, very from beginning. From the very yeah. beginning, right? It's not an add-on after the fact. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree with that completely. Um, I, I know we could talk for a lot longer, and I can tell you something else you want to say. No, no you're good? No, no. Um, can, we do, can we do Q and A, or would you rather us do that casually afterwards? Yeah, so. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, your perspectives have been so great. And, um, and if anyone is interested in checking out the event next weekend, talk to me or Asif. Uh, we did post, put the code up there for, for discounts, really. We try to make it affordable for indies and people in the not-for-profit space. So I hope you can join us. Um, and you can see more of, of these guys up here on the stage. Thank you. <laughs>